What is going on, everybody? James Hancock here. I'm back to review Phil Tippett's film, Mad God, a movie that quite literally has been 30 years in the making. It's coming to theaters on June 10th and is coming to Shudder on June 16th. And pieces of it have been available online over the years, but it's hard to know where to start when discussing this because so much of the anticipation of Mad God is the story behind it and who Phil Tippett is and his background, as well as the movie itself. So I guess I should just do both because both aspects are absolutely fascinating. And luckily, they sent me a nice little press kit to help summarize all the key points. So let's start with the synopsis of what the hell Mad God even is. Follow the assassin through a forbidding world of tortured souls, decrepit bunkers, and wretched monstrosities forged from the most primordial horrors of the subconscious mind. Every set, creature, and effigy in this macabre masterpiece is handcrafted and painstakingly animated using traditional stop-motion techniques. Mad God is a labor of love, a testament to the power of creative grit, and an homage to the timeless art of stop-motion animation. Ready your eyes, ready your spirit. Prepare to meet your maker. I don't know who wrote that, but you couldn't ask for a better summary of what the Mad God experience is all about. And not to worry, I won't be going into any spoilers for my review, but this is not really a movie that can be spoiled because it doesn't really follow any sort of conventional storytelling structure. Uh, I hate to use the word surrealist, but it is surrealist and illogical and follows the logic of a dream. It has a lot more in common with something like Dante's Inferno, or like the surrealist stop motion uh, claymation films by Jan Svankmeyer than it does with like Star Wars. But coincidentally, that's where Phil Tippett kind of got his start. One of the earliest things he did was put together the little monsters in that chess battle on the Millennium Falcon way back in 1977. And it's fascinating seeing those techniques kind of reach their full fruition or kind of reach their full potential in Mad God, because if you love stop motion, sadly, there are very few great practitioners of it still actively working today, or at least working on a grand scale, working on Hollywood films. We, we get one here and there, but I absolutely adore stop motion. It's an incredibly tactile, physical medium that's just worlds apart from your conventional kind of digital CGI. And admittedly, every tool out there has their appropriate use. Every tool out there has a time and place, but we obviously overindulge these days with things that can be done on the computer, and it's just nice to see something what you feel like you could physically play with it as you're watching it. And if I were to summarize my impressions of Mad God, it's it's gonna be hard not to sound hyperbolic or like or that I'm not like trying to oversell it, but it is quite literally this earth-shattering work of staggering originality, vision, imagination. It's not a fairy tale, but it's more like this nightmare that you can't pull your eyes away from it. And it's got all sorts of incredible ingredients from science fiction dystopias to mythological madness. And some might describe it as like a pop culture hand grenade that's designed to kind of shock people out of their complacency. But I'm going to go a few steps further, and I hope you'll forgive a little vulgarity. But it's a little bit like a pop culture enema designed to flush out all the shit that we're force-fed on a regular basis over on Disney Plus or whatever the case might be. This is the kind of uh, movie-going experience where if little kids walk in during the middle of it, they're going to cry and run out of the room screaming. It's a really intense experience. And if, like me, you're tired of watching aging franchises being taken over by lackluster, second-rate storytellers who never bring anything new to the table... This is going to be a complete and total breath of fresh air because I would argue that in any given frame taken in isolation in this movie, you're going to find more imagination, creativity, and originality than in an entire season of some stupid show over on Disney+. Plus. So you might be asking at this point, who is this madman responsible for Mad God? I've been vaguely aware of Phil Tippett as an individual here and there. He always pops up as a talking head and things like In Search of Tomorrow. Because in his early days, like I mentioned before, he worked on Star Wars, but he also worked on Robocop, he worked on Jurassic Park, he worked on Starship Troopers, he worked on Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, Willow. I mean, he's worked with a lot of luminaries, uh, a, lot, a lot of the best filmmakers of the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and 
has played a large role in kind of shaping all the extraordinary special effects that made those movies feel like they live and breathe. And here are a few quotes from the people that he has worked with. Steven Spielberg says, Phil Tippett brings good things to life. Or if you're a fan of Guillermo del Toro, he says, Phil Tippett is a master. He is the man of a thousand creatures. But I prefer Paul Verhoeven's line where he says, Phil contributed to my movies in the most magnificent, technologically innovative and artistic ways. I would have been lost without him. I mean, Paul Verhoeven's one of my all-time favorite filmmakers, and I've been watching his movies my entire life, and he's still going strong. That's high praise coming from one of the great visionaries. And while he's been at work, his studio has continued to work on modern-day production shows like Falcon and the Winter Soldier and The Mandalorian and things like that. But it seems like, as a creator, this is his real passion project where he didn't have a career as a writer or as a director or as a storyteller, but this was his opportunity to kind of just encapsulate all of his influences, whatever muse is driving him, just all of his creative impulses. He's poured them all into this single production. And here's a little background on um, how the film got up and running. Phil Tippett had the idea for Mad God during a lull in his schedule after Robocop 2. After sketching and designing a few creatures and sets, he and his stage and stop motion team at Tippett Studio shot the first few scenes of Mad God, including the shot of the beast strapped to a table and a tracking shot of the shipmen walking through a desiccated subterranean city. When he received the call to supervise the dinosaurs for Jurassic Park, Phil suspended work on the project. Jurassic Park proved to be a watershed moment in the evolution of visual effects, with a shift from handmade visual effects, the like of which Tippett was best known for, to computer-generated graphics and imagery. Phil saw the writing on the wall and thought the kind of work he was doing with Mad God had gone extinct overnight. Some 20 years later, while cleaning out the back storage areas of Tippett Studios' Berkeley stages, several of his key artists and supervisors stumbled across original puppets and sets from those early shots. Revisiting the original footage and models, this new generation of artists, trained primarily on computers, longed to learn from Phil and assist as he revived his long-since abandoned film. Together with a volunteer crew, Phil taught a new generation of artists and craftspeople as they brought his labor of love to life. In 2020, while the world sheltered through a global pandemic, Phil continued and completed the final scenes of what is now a complete feature-length, experimental, mostly animated, adult-oriented, cinematic masterpiece. Mad God invites its viewers not so much as to watch a story unfold as to be transported from the world to another world entirely, one of monsters and war pigs, where traditional narrative structures are mere suggestions, and the world we live in can be viewed as if through the the lens of Hieronymus Bosch crossed with Buster Keaton. Now, I don't predict that this movie is going to have massive crossover commercial appeal the way that things like Robocop or Jurassic Park or Star Wars have. It's not really going for that. I mean, if your idea of a story is about like a young warrior finding a magical sword, killing a dragon and getting the girl, you will find this story, and I use the word story very loosely, or perhaps I should use it in quotes, you will find this story to be very unsatisfying because it doesn't really bow to any commercial constraints of any kind. But it's better to think of this more as a journey and as a metaphorical journey because it's a journey that just goes deeper and darker and stranger. And every landscape that you get to is just like this chamber of horrors unlike anything you've ever seen. But the imagination is so unrestrained, it's hard not to be just enraptured by the imagery even if what you're looking at is completely sick and disturbing. And I suspect that the success of this movie will be judged more by how many filmmakers and craftspeople and just creative people in general does it inspire to go on to do some of the best work of their career because I think this is something that's going to open up a lot of people's imagination. It'll inspire them to explore new directions that they never would have considered. There's not a single rule of traditional Hollywood filmmaking that this movie adheres to, and my hope is that there'll be somebody who's like 19 or 20 now who dreams of creating monsters in their garage who's gonna see this movie and be like, oh my God, like you really can just go off with a handful of people, and even if it takes decades, create your own universe, your own world that's not beholden to any existing intellectual property. And I know at this point I've been singing this movie's praises quite a bit without saying a single thing wrong about it. I do have a few critiques. Every once in a while, live action actors will appear in it, including filmmaker Alex Cox, who gave us masterpieces like Repo Man and Sid and Nancy. That took me out of the movie. Who knows? There might be some Alex Cox fans out there who see him in the movie like, oh my God, that's so fucking cool. I love Alex Cox. I immediately was kind of ripped out of the experience when he popped in and I found it very distracting. And if I were to offer one other major critique, 
This is not the kind of movie you want to come home late at night, like at two in the morning when you've had a few drinks and you're like, hey, I'm going to watch Mad God because it doesn't kind of give you anything to kind of help carry you along. There's some movies out there, sci-fi, fantasy, horror, whatever, that kind of pick you up in their hands and take you on a journey. This is a movie where you kind of have to drink your espresso and kind of sit up and pay attention. Be like, all right, what the fuck's going on here? Because it's very open to a ton of different interpretations. My own interpretation by the end was that it's a bit of a, I don't know, a metaphor for the creative process in terms of how people give birth to ideas. Those ideas are used. They're torn into a million pieces, recycled and reused. And it's kind of this endless cycle of death and rebirth. But other viewers might have a completely different reaction to it. But what I responded to most was how this movie was totally unafraid to explore incredibly mixed and conflicting emotions at the same time, basically presenting you with images that are at times disgusting, disturbing, arousing, and hypnotic all at once, where you quite, you quite literally don't know what to make of what you're watching. And for a lot of people, that's going to be a very uncomfortable experience, and there you are. they're going to get frustrated and they'll turn it off. But if you stick with it, you're going to see some of the most intoxicating imagery you've ever seen. And like I said, this is going to be spoiler free, but a lot of these images in the trailer are out there. So I'm going to, I'm going to consider all those images to be totally fair game. But by the end of the movie, you will feel like you've been to hell and back or to the forest reaches of the, like the, the end of the cosmos. This is a, a spiritual journey of the imagination that is unlike anything you're going to see in the multiplex probably for the next 30 years. I mean, if you like things like David Lynch's Eraserhead, or as I mentioned before, Jan Svankmeyer's Claymation movies, or if you like the animation sequences from Alan Parker's film Pink Floyd The Wall, you're gonna feel right at home watching this. I guess the last thing that I found so refreshing about it is that this is a movie that exists completely in a moral and political vacuum. And we live in an era right now where obviously so many shows and movies are completely, totally overly invested in discussing morality and politics, et cetera, and so forth. And it's nice to have a movie where it's just a completely aesthetic experience that's not forcing anything on you at all. So much so that I imagine some people who are very accustomed to being force-fed morality and politics from their content be like, well, I don't know what to do with this because it's not telling me what to think. And to that, I would simply tell those people, fuck you, learn to think for yourself. And this is a movie that's going to force everybody who watches it to think for themselves and come to their own conclusions and their own interpretations. And so while in the long run, I think this is going to be way too abstract to become sort of runaway hit, but it will continue to live on in generation after generation of filmmakers who are open to it, who absorbed it, who have internalized it and allowed them to inspire their own writing or their own filmmaking or their own animation. So I guess in the final analysis, I'm just blown away that Phil Tippett made this thing he didn't need to make this. I mean, he could have gone on working on other people's movies for the rest of his life and had a very satisfying career where people would have regarded him as an effects giant to be mentioned in the same breath as any other effects giant from history. But I like it. I was like, you know what? I'm getting a little older and I've got a story that's inside me that's just begging to come out. And so high five to Phil Tippett and all the young crew members who decided to, as a labor of love to go to work from the master. And I hope that he has passed on all of his unique skills and ideas so that those ideas and skills and techniques can continue to be employed by the next generation of filmmakers. But I think that's all I can really say about this without going into specifics and spoilers, etc. So whether you live at a near a theater that's going to be playing it or whether you're just a Shudder subscriber, definitely recommend that people take a crack at it, have a look at it. High five to Shudder for getting behind this film. Thank you to Shudder for sending me the film in advance so I could have a look. Also, I should include one final mention of the sponsor of my podcast, Manscaped. Technically, they're a sponsor of the podcast, but I'm going to push the promotion code over here as well because if you uh, haven't been doing the appropriate maintenance below your waist, there is no better product on this planet than that sold by Manscaped. So go to their website and check out their performance package 4.0 and use the promo code WRONGREAL in all caps. Your little jumbly tumblers or your John Thomas will thank you. But I hope you enjoyed this review. If so, please remember to subscribe to the channel, hit that notification bell, like, share, all that good stuff. Hope everyone has an amazing week, but more importantly, as always, onwards and upwards.